sisters, tonight, insha'Allah, is a very important topic which we use in all our life. The footsteps or the tricks of the shaitan. First of all, let us begin by talking about what is the shaitan? What is a shaitan? What is iblis? What is a jinn? What, what is a marid? What is a afrit? Let's start with these words, inshallah, because they are all mentioned in the Quran. Do Muslims believe in shaitan, Satan? Yes. But let's explain it, inshallah ta'ala. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran in very clear words. In Surah Fatir, verse number 6. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الشيطان لكم عدو فاتخذوه عدوا إن الشيطان لكم عدو فاتخذوه عدوا إنما يدعو حزبه ليكونوا من أصحاب السعير so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by telling us the shaitan is an enemy for you. He is your enemy. So take him as an enemy. Because sometimes an enemy, you can see a person is your enemy, but you want to try and appeal to his or her heart. Allah is saying the shaitan is not someone you can appeal to their goodness. They are tricksters. So he says, take him as an enemy. And then Allah says, as a matter of fact, he or the shaitan always calls you to their group, to their cult, so that you can be among the people of the fire. These are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the shaitan? My brothers and sisters, the shaitan means literally in Arabic, anyone who deludes someone from truth, to falsehood and anyone who deludes someone from good to bad from benefit to destruction that's what the word shaitan means in arabic shaitana by this meaning the shaitan can be in three different creatures the first creature is called the jinn we'll talk about the jinn the second creature is the human you can have a human shaitan and a jinn shaitan and there are also, according to the Quran and Sunnah, there are also animal shaitans. What is the difference? First of all, the jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran in very clear statements in many, many passages of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a life form called the jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخَلَقَ الْجَانَّ مِن and he created the jan, the jinns, from a smokeless fire. And many other passages, there's even a whole surah called Surah Al Jinn, the chapter of the jinn. Say, O Muhammad, that a group of jinns came towards me and listened to the Quran. And there's a long surah. A jinn is made out of a smokeless fire. So when you look at a fire, and you've got, it's made up of several layers. The top layer, which is the orangey one, is, produces the most smoke. And then you've got another layer, which is yellowish, and then the blue. The blue has absolutely no flame. It has, sorry, no smoke. So somewhere in there, that's what the jinn, the Quran says, they are created from. And Allah tells us in the Quran, that they can see us, but we can't see them. But Allah also says in the Quran, <laughs> The power of the shaitan is very weak. You should not be afraid of the shaitan. You should not give the shaitan more power than what they are given. The only time the shaitan overcomes you is when you reduce your power to lower than his power, which means that you give in and you start fearing him or her, or the, whatever the shaitan is. And in Surah Al-Jinn, Surah Al-Jinn, what number is it? Chapter in, in uh, Juz Al-Tabarak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the jinns that they spoke among each other. When they heard the message of the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and some of them believed they became Muslim. 
They became Muslims. So jinns, there are believers and there are disbelievers and there are atheists and Christians and Jews and everything. And it seems like the jinns that were listening to the Prophet ﷺ were possibly Jews because they mentioned Moses a lot. And they had converted to Islam listening to the Prophet's Quran and they spoke highly of it in Surah Al-Jinn. And in that surah, the jinns say something. They said, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِّنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَهَقًا He said, they said, and there were people from among the early Arabs, they used to go into deserts and open fields, and they have to stay there, so on their journey, on a travel, and they would get afraid of the jinns, of the stories they used to hear. And they used to get up and they would say, O oh, jinns, O oh, jinns, we seek refuge in you, please don't harm us. Allah says that the jinns would reply to each other, When they found out the humans were afraid of them, they increased their horror and terror against them. They made them more terrified. So Allah tells us, don't be afraid of the jinn. And my brothers and sisters, the, the jinn, therefore, is a life form which Allah created before the human beings. How do we know? Well, there is a verse in the Quran, for example, there are several verses, but one verse talks about the story of the great leader of all the shaitans, whose name is Iblis. You all know the name Iblis, right? That's his actual name. And it's a description. There's only one shaitan called Iblis. All right, and then we call the rest of his children, because the Quran says that Iblis has a riya, he, he has a whole tribe, he has all children. And their children are called Abalisa, plural for Iblis. But they're all really shaitans. Iblis was a good person. And he had a, a role with the angels. And I think a lot of people, they mix, they misunderstand. They say, how is Iblis, how could he disobey Allah and be filled with pride and arrogance when he was an angel, when we know that angels don't disobey Allah? The answer to that, brothers and sisters, is that Iblis is not an angel. He has always been a jinn. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifted his rank at one stage because he was very righteous. However, inside of his heart there was something wrong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us in different ways in order for our hearts to reveal its truth. So we know ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fair. Only those who, who deserve his reward will get it. And Allah will test our hearts in different ways, brothers and sisters. So he tested Iblis's heart, who was of the jinns, and he created Adam. And when he created Adam, السلام, a new life form after him, it tells us, first of all, that the jinns existed before us. And then the human beings came after. And Iblis got jealous and arrogant, and he asked, why would God make this human to uh, inherit the earth and to do work? Uh, and, and be honored to Allah. And then he orders the angels to bow to Adam. So Iblis rebelled against Allah. How? The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Iblis a kafir, a disbeliever and an outcast, was not because he merely disobeyed Allah. It was not because he merely did not bow to Adam. The reason is that Iblis, he, by his argument with Allah, and Allah knows his heart, he actually denied denied some of Allah's names and glory, his attribute. What did he deny? He denied that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just and fair, and that Iblis himself is more fair. Listen to what Allah says in the Quran. Iblis said, Iblis said, uh, when Allah told him, why didn't you bow down to Adam? He said, Ana khayrun minhu. I am better than him. Min narin wa min teen. You created me out of fire and you created him out of earth. What is Iblis saying here? He's saying, you, O oh Allah, whom you honored me, and I've been in the rank of the angels, so Iblis knows Allah better than all of us. He's saying to him, O oh God, I know better than you, and I am fairer than you, and you are unjust for making him better than me. Allah is unjust, and Iblis knows better. This is how he made kufr. That Allah's qada and qadr, his predestination and his will, was going to come to pass, and Iblis disobeyed and disbelieved in Allah's will even. He did not accept God's decree, he did not accept God's decision and his will. 
which effectively means that, oh God, oh Allah, I know better than you. You don't make fair choices, uh, sorry, decisions. You don't make good will. Your qadr is flawed. That's why Iblis became a disbeliever. Now you might say, would it happen to us? It can happen. But Iblis knows Allah better. He's among the ranks of the angels, lived for thousands of years. His punishment is greater. He should know best, better. That's why even Iblis swears by Allah. Says, وَعِزَّتِكَ وَجَلَالِكَ After the long argument, he said, وَعِزَّتِكَ وَجَلَالِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ That's where it all began. He said, O oh Allah, by your might and by your glory, I am going to lead all of them astray, meaning all of the children of Adam. Revenge. إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Except your servants among them who are sincere and devout in their heart. They are not hypocrites. They are not liars. They're not dishonest in their promise to you. When they say their word, they stick to it. They repent to you. They are sincere in their hearts. They are truthful to their word. They fulfill what they promised you. When they said the shahada, they fulfilled it. They prayed their five daily prayers. They fasted their Ramadan. They obeyed you and did not deny verses of the Quran. They did not argue with it. They're sincere. You understand, brothers and sisters? And Allah says, go ahead and you use all your tricks. Allah gave him ideas. He says, use all your tricks, Iblis. Allah said to him, go ahead and do all your tricks that you're thinking of. See, Allah knows exactly what Iblis is thinking. What is he thinking? He told him, go and try your best with my servants. Uh, and join, join with them in your tricks by deluding or, or associating yourself with their families, in their wealth, with their children, and give them false promises, if you like. You can give all your promises. And Allah then says to us, the shaitan never promises you in truth. He's always a deceiver. Now you might think, oh my God, he's, he's, he's unleashed against us. But Allah tells you, no, 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 I gave you the Quran. I gave you the messengers. I gave you the prophets. I'm warning you. I'm telling you. He is your enemy. Now when you have a vice like that, an enemy like that, then it is easier to tell what is right from wrong, what is good from bad, what is righteous from unrighteous. A lot of people, they say to me, well, just do good. All right, well, how do you know what is good? The only way you know that is good Number one, it's instinctive, there's human nature. And secondly, we don't know all the good. You need to compare it to something else. There has to be a standard. Just like in science, when you want to experiment, you want to find you know, the reaction of something. You need something called a control. You put something in a little tube. So it's my science coming in now. You put something in a tube, let's say water. And you want to make a reaction, and then you're going to compare it to water and see what changes happen. If you don't have a control, you're not going to be able to know what changes happen. So Allah created Iblis, and Iblis and the Shaitan represent evil and wrong and he told us this is wrong this is right and he created people who do evil and we know the evil from the right people who do wrong people who upset you people who oppress you people who wrong you and what do you learn out of it you learn forgiveness you learn pardoning you learn mercy you learn right from wrong you strengthen yourself as well you're able to tell people apart who you can trust and who you can't otherwise everybody will look good so Allah brings out all of this stuff just like he brought it out in the heart of Iblis. Now, brothers and sisters, the shaitan after that day promised that he will lead all of the children of Adam السلام, astray. And he said to Allah, uh, If you were, if you leave me alive until the day of judgment, I am going to steer, steer his progeny, all of the human beings, like the way you steer a horse. Al-Hanak is the jaw here, and that's, that means this is how you put the reins in a horse, and it goes back into the mouth, close to the jaw. That's called Ahtanikanna. I will steer them like the way a person steers a horse. And then he said, I will come to them from in front of them and from behind them and a distance from their right and a distance from their left. So Allah says, right in front of them. And from the back, 
وعن أيمانهم and from a distance because عن means a distance from the right وعن وعن شمائلهم and from a distance at the left. Why did he say these? Because the shaitan is able to come forward from here and from the back, but on the side, some ulama said, the angels that sit on the right and left never leave you alone, and they are tremendous. Whereas here in the front and the back, there is an easier pathway. However, what he missed is saying, he didn't say, I'll come towards them from the top and from the bottom. The shaitan said, I will come from in front, from the back, from a distance from the right, from a distance from the left, but he did not say from above them and from below them. Now this is all a metaphor, but why didn't Iblis say, I will approach them from above them and from below them? Which means that he's going to get us from all sides, except from the top and bottom. Some of the Mufassirun, Ulama, scholars that told us, because when you say your dua and turn to Allah, it goes upwards. And aboveness is your dua. Allah subhanahu wa says, إِلَيْهِ يَصْعَدُ الْكَلِمُ الطَّيِّبُ وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ يَرْفَعُ To him ascends good deeds and the beautiful words, dua and dhikr. And Allah does not let anyone, any shaitan get in between him, between Allah and your dua and your dhikr. From below them, when you go to sujood, when you're in sujood, that's at the bottom. And Allah does not let anyone get in between him and your sujood when you're on the ground. And the shaitan cannot approach you in these two ways. So what is the key? When, whenever the shaitan comes and gives you whispers and tries to attack you and tries to delude you, then remember, call upon the Lord who created the shaitan to save you and connect with him. The shaitan cannot get between you. And go into sujood in your salat that will strengthen you and weaken the shaitan. So these are our two avenues of saving ourselves. As for in front of us, we see the world. Because when we look around, what do we see? We see all the temptations. Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah says, and do not extend your eye out from what you see in the luxuries and the delusions of what they have. This is all just the flower, the blossom of their temporary world. So we see things in front of us, the shaitan then uses that. From behind us, sneakily, he gives us whispers sneakily. And from our sides, he whispers to us into our ears. My dear brothers and sisters, we said that the shaitan is the jinn. Then what is the human shaitan? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa is to tell us, seek refuge in Allah from the shaitan of the jinn, the shaitan al-ins, the shaitan of the human. Remember when we said shaitan means those who delude you away from the right path. So it's evil. A jinn can become a shaitan and really evil, and a human can become a shaitan and really evil. They are the really bad friends who become evil. They don't respect the Quran, they don't respect Allah, they don't respect even themselves, they've got no shame. They, they, they worship their desires and they try to delude you into the wrong place. I'll give you an example of a human being. So some human beings are full out shaitans. They're always shaitans. Some human beings are shaitans sometimes. Some human beings are really good, but there comes moments where their shaitan deludes them and they become transformed into this little shaitan for a little while. I'll tell you which types they are. They're the people who pray in a day and do everything, and their shaitan comes up and they say, man, you've been praying a lot, you've done Ramadan a lot, mashallah, you know, you've got a whole bag of hasanat, it's time for you to let your hair down a bit, just for tonight, just for tomorrow. And then the next day, you go back and pray and ask Allah to forgive you. So that moment is vulnerability. And then you'll go and say, you can't do it without your mates, you've got to call your mates. Oh, you can't do your mates without having something entertaining. Why don't you get some cigarettes? Why don't you get some vapes? Why don't you get some argila? Why don't you go to a beautiful joint? Some of them, why don't you roll up a joint and do something like that? Because it will make you just escape the reality of the world. You know, you're going through too much stress. You've gone through too much. You've got problems with your family, you at work, at school, um, with the Muslims around you. They all give you a headache. Why don't you just go and mellow out a little bit? And then ask Allah to forgive you. Anyway, the scholars did say that it could be a minor sin. That's how the shaitan talks to you. These are whispers. Justifications after justifications, but the shaitan looks for the vulnerability. Ibn al-Qayyim, a great scholar, he said, the shaitan can actually feel, can feel your heartbeat and can feel your weaknesses. Something about a sixth sense with the shaitan, the jinn, the jinn shaitan. And feels when you're vulnerable and will attack you from there. So you've got to be aware. Say, so, I will not listen to that. And it requires a bit of mujahada, a bit of struggle. So this shaitan al-ins comes and tells you, come on, let's do it, and justifies. 
everything for you. You spend a bit of time with them. Next minute, you find yourself in terrible, terrible trouble. Brothers and sisters, that's why Rasul used to warn us about an evil friend. At that moment, that friend is a shaitan calling you to evil. You might be with him and say, it's time for salat. Well, I've got to pray. Then don't worry about salat, man. You know, we can pray tomorrow. We have these types of friends. So Rasul Sallallahu tells us, be careful of what kind of friend you have. Some friends, they, they pry. They want to know everything about your family, about your life, about personal life, because they, they just want to backbite you or gossip about you or to use it as a weapon against you one day. I tell this to younger teenagers, say, listen, be careful. Some friends, don't make them too close yet. You've got to really know them. Like one man came to Umar al-Khattab and said, Ya, ya, ya Amir al-Mu'minin, I know this person, I trust him. He says, did you travel with him? Did you uh, deal with him in business? Have you done anything that involves something sensitive? He says, no. He says, maybe you saw him pray a lot at the mosque. He goes, yeah. He goes, you don't know him. You don't know anything about him. So uh, you can't trust everybody else, right? And sometimes I tell these teenagers, be careful the type of friends and what kind of secrets you tell them. Because one day, if you have a fallout, I've seen a lot of these so-called friends they use that against you and they spread rumors about you to use it against you to get revenge. So you've got to be very careful with your secrets and privacy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about eight different types of friends in the Quran. And one of them who is the worst, that is like the shaitan, is called a khazul. The shaitan is truly a betrayer, a two-faced uh, cheater and liar to the human. Tells you one thing and next minute throws you under the bus. So be careful of these types of human shaitans as well. And lastly, the animal shaitan. Rasul told us that some snakes are actually shaitans and jinns. Sometimes they could be, uh, there's a hadith that talks about really dark black dogs with two spots above their eyes. Now, I've never seen one like that. So don't go around getting all paranoid and thinking your neighbor's dog is a shaitan, brothers and sisters. Honestly, we have this problem among the Muslims with all this stuff. Yani, these types of superstitious stuff must be a shaitan. That person looked at me, look at his eyes, his eyes look weird. That means he's, he's a shaitan. Uh, someone choked, must be possessed. You know, someone uh, you know, looked at me in a funny way, must be whatever. Uh, you forgot your lines, Oof, I've got an eye. Uh, brother and sister, just take it easy. A Muslim is not to be that weak and that paranoid, insha'Allah ta'ala. Someone looked up in a cloud. I'm waiting for the sign. That cloud, it has the name Allah written in it. Look at that. That's a sign. Oh, that cloud, it's dark. I bet you it's a shaitan. So we, we can't... This is not how Islam and the deen teaches us, brothers and sisters. A very practical religion, actually. And we have beliefs which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about. So let's move on. Let's now talk about the tricks of the shaitan and his deception now that you know all these details. Brothers and sisters... The first thing you need to know about the jinn shaitan is that the jinn shaitan, male or female, does not approach you in the way you expect. They're smart about it. They're tricksters. If they know there's something that you will be too strong for, then they, will, they, won't, they won't bring that strong thing to you yet. They'll just bring you a little bit of it, followed by another one, followed by another. It's called the footsteps of the shaitan. And this is in the Quran in Surah An-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tattabi'u khutuwaat al-shaytan wa man yattabi'u khutuwaat al-shaytan fa innahu ya'muruhu bil-fahshai wal-munkar O oh, you who believe, do not follow the footsteps the footsteps of the shaitan, and whoever of you follows the footsteps, plural, of the shaitan, then he is going to command you with only two things. Fahsha, which means dirty, shameless deeds. Wal munkar, and immoral, sinful acts. That's all the shaitan wants to do. He wants to lead you astray and comes to you step by step. Gets you desensitized. Have you ever heard of that word desensitized? Desensitized means that sometime in your life, something that is not good in your brain and in your heart, you saw it as big. It's a major not good thing. It's not a good thing. And you wouldn't do it. But as time went past, the type of friends that you're with, the type of compromisation that you did, type of little tiny sins and haram that you did one after the other led you step by step to the point where you look back five years back and you say, 
I don't know what I was worried about. Five years later, that thing that was so big to you and shameful and haram, you become desensitized to it, it becomes easy. And I would like to comment a little bit in today's uh, modern world, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of many experts, that um, the music industry itself has changed so much than what it used to be. And the themes of music that surround us playing in our ears over and over and over again are truly, they are manipulating and truly changing the ideology and the hearts of people. They're becoming desensitized to it. And he, there was this song playing somewhere, and uh, I won't say the whole story, but somebody said, uh, uh, okay, well, um, you know, let's play this song at my, at my wedding. And then I said to them, this song, can't you hear what they're saying? They're talking about vodka. They're talking about alcohol and vodka and, and weed and stuff like that. So oh, I didn't really listen to it. I, I didn't really hear it. I was just into the beat. And that's what happens. You become desensitized to what is actually going into your ears and changing your heart. Because what are the themes? The themes in, in music industry, especially in the West, let alone the Arabic, even the Arabic songs is about, you can, if you look at them, they've got a, a few themes. One of the themes is betrayal. It, it desensitizes you to cheating. The husband and wife cheating on each other. What's the problem? What's the issue? So long as you're happy. There are Arabic songs that talk about desensitizing you that way. And let alone the Western songs at the moment, the pop and R&B and I don't know what and the balut. All these types of music, they drive you around themes that just demoralize you. Now you might be saying, not every song. I heard someone say, uh, music is the gift of God to humans. Well, yeah, it makes you feel nice, some of them, for a little while, but actually it doesn't really solve your problems. And the majority of people who listen to the music, they're not really becoming any better. They're becoming more toxic these days, because music now has become a very toxic world. It talks about toxicity, let alone violence and aggression. That's, you know, in the past, in rap music, it talks about toxicity, man. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of families break apart, relationships are falling apart, people are becoming more narcissistic, toxic, uh, even we've even learned new words now. Everybody uses the word gaslight, toxic, and narcissistic. Everybody uses that. <laughs> you see two two people, each one calling the other person narcissist. We're all psychologists now, but the music world has desensitized us and created this toxicity within us. I mean, we don't even realize it. Read more about it, brothers and sisters. Wallahi, I kid you not. I wish I didn't have to say that. Now, brothers and sisters, let's move on a little bit. The shaitan comes to you step by step. There is a story about a man. Have you heard the story of Barsisa? Yeah. Have you? Hands up if you have heard about Barsisa. Okay, not too many. Okay, let's, let's share the story very quickly. This story is not a hadith. It's the Prophet ﷺ didn't say it. But Ibn Abbas and uh, one of the companions and some of the uh, scholars like Al-Tabari, they mentioned it and Bukhari mentions it in his book, but it's under the heading Israeliyat. So the stories of the people of the children of Israel. And these stories that Rasul ﷺ, Muhammad ﷺ said, um, you can talk about the stories of the scribes or the children of Israel, meaning the people of the book, stories that come from the Bible and the, and the Torah and the old uh, books, so long as they don't oppose your teachings of Islam or call you to sin. But don't say that, don't confirm them and don't deny them. So there are things in the Israelite traditions which don't go against Islam, they're stories have, which with, with good morals. But the Prophet ﷺ said, you can't confirm them or deny them. We're not sure if they really happened. But this particular story about Barsisa is mentioned because the meaning agrees with Islam. So the story goes like this, that there, is, there was a, 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 um, there, there, there was a worshipper, we'll just call him a worshipper, and he was uh, very respected in the town. He used to worship inside, of, he was like a monk. And everybody respected him, but he had little knowledge, uh, lots of worship, and he was a monk that did not associate with any bad things, and he was just all pure and everything. And everybody respected him in the town. And as there were these four brothers. These four brothers had to go somewhere on a journey, but they had a sister who was sick, and they needed somebody to look after that no, no other family. So they said, why don't you go to Barsisa? He will look after her. So Barsisa uh, agreed to look after their sister, cutting the story short, and he started to uh, take her food and medicine. So one day the shaitan said to Barsisa, you know, you've never laid eyes on that girl, that, that woman, if you were just look and make sure that she's okay. So then he looked at her once, and then he said, okay, well, why don't you talk to her? She's probably lonely. Her brothers have been away for such a long time. 
Why don't you talk to her and keep her company? He said, all right, so he started keeping her up, up to this point, there's no haram, right? But the shaitan has a trick, right? And Barsisa didn't realize what's actually happening. So he kept on talking, and from talking, he said, why don't you go inside and spend some time with her and keep her company? Her brothers have taken a little while, you know, just make sure she could die in the house and you wouldn't know. So he justified it to look like he's doing a really good thing. So he started to meeting and sitting around, and then from there, he got impressed and he started to let his hair down a little bit and... Uh, testosterone levels went up a little bit and all that stuff and then he started to get closer and closer and closer in the end you all know cover the, you know fill in the gaps and then he ended up committing zina uh, fornication with her and from her they came he, he the brothers had taken more than a year off so she became pregnant and gave birth to a baby and so the shaitan came to him and said the, your, the brothers are going to come back and they're going to kill you so you better do something about it so what should i do what should i do now, in the past, the Prophet ﷺ said that in the past, sometimes they used to see the shaitan, they used to see the jinns. Now we don't see them, but they used to see them. And there are many evidences in the sunnah that some people have seen them in the past, such as the one with Abu Huraira. It's a long story. And uh, he said to him, you should kill her and kill her baby and bury them together and say she died from the disease. So he did that. Fear. The shaitan puts fear in you and puts different paranoia is in you. So he did that. When the brothers came along, they asked and he said she died because she was sick. And what happened is that all four of them, the shaitan came in their dreams and told them, this Barsisa guy is lying to you. He went and he did this and he did that and he buried her at such a place. And you can see a little bit of her cloth around, just st sticking outside the grave. That's what the shaitan said. So one of them woke up and he says, this is what I saw, a weird dream. And the other three, they said, you're right, we saw the same dream, let's go and check. And truly they found their sister buried with her baby. So they went to Barsisa and took him to the authorities and they sentenced him to death. So when they came to kill him, the shaitan came up to him and he goes, look at you, a righteous man, you've done all this stuff. You know, what are people going to say? What kind of a legacy have you left behind? He made him feel guilty. The shaitan makes you feel guilty. And he said, what should I do? And the shaitan said to him, well, I'm the one who got you into this mess. I'm the only one who can get you out of this mess. He said, what do you want me to do? He said, just do one thing and I'll get you out. He says, what do you want me to do? He said, just make a sajda to me. Just prostrate to me, you know, and make me, you know, godly. So he said, okay. He prayed and made a sajda to him. He says, you're my God. And then he got hanged. And the shaitan immediately said, Oh, this is exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted you to become a disbeliever into hellfire forever. Inni bari ummink. Inni akhafullaha rabbal alameen. I am innocent from you. I fear Allah, the Lord of mankind. And this ayah is actually in the Quran. كَمَثَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذْ قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ كفر فَلَمَّا كَفَرَ قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّمْ Allah says, just like the shaitan, when he said to the human being, disbelieve. And when the human being disbelieved, the shaitan took a step away and said, I am innocent of what you chose to do. I fear Allah. I am not one of those who do what you do. And this is actually the khutbah of Iblis in, uh, when, when the people are driven to Jahannam, to hellfire. It's in the Quran, the khutbah of Iblis. And he gives a khutbah to all the people of hellfire before they go in. And he says to them, it's a long verse in the Quran. He says, hey, listen, everybody, I know what you're thinking. You're going to blame me. How about we agree? You do you, you do you, and I'll do me. <laughs> Nobody blame anyone else. He says, I merely invited you, man. I just talked to you. I just whispered. I didn't force you. I called you and invited you and you accepted the invitation. Don't blame me. Hey, you've got to blame yourselves. In another verse it says, I never had any power over you. Except that I invited you. That's all I did. I just sent you the invitation card. I did it a lot. Yeah, I know. But you listen. I didn't have power. I didn't bring you with your ear and bring the alcohol to your doorstep and the woman to your doorstep. And the man, you and I didn't bring all that stuff to your doorstep. I didn't bring the, the knife and the gun to you. I didn't do all that stuff. So then he says, how about every man to himself? And then he says, I am innocent of what you do. <laughs> that's, the, that's the final words of this Iblis. Trick number one, my dear brothers and sisters, there are eight. 
Ibn al-Qayyim, in his book, Adda' wa Dawa' and other books, he mentions a summary of eight different tricks that the shaitan attacks us with. And these are eight things that he goes after, eight goals that he wants in us. Goal number one. The first thing the shaitan tries to attack you with to get you to do is the ultimate one. It's called shirk. To make partners with Allah. Just like he did to Barsisa. Why? The shaitan does not want you to enter hellfire and get out again. He doesn't want you to be a half a Muslim or three quarters Muslim. He wants to be a, 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 a half a kafir, he, he, like just a quarter Muslim. He wants you to be no Muslim at all. He doesn't want you to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. No righteousness whatsoever. He wants you to be a complete kafir to stay in hellfire forever. So he goes after shirk, associate partners with Allah. Now, if he knows that you're too strong for that, the shaitan starts to whisper to other friends to come around you to delude you and give you some ideas. Maybe he'll give your friends ideas to come and delude you with money. Hey, we've got a job offer for you. How about that? And involve shirk, for example. If you can't get major shirk, we'll get you into minor shirk. For example, makes you look at, you know, this day and age, you look at, for example, astrology and star signs and zodiac signs and reading your palm and uh, knowing which month you were born in. And then the shaitan comes and says, hey, this is cool. Let's use social media to make a trend on zodiac signs and star signs. And remember that he's trying to step by step get you there into shirk. Why don't you go and do this or do that? Gives you little ideas. Sometimes you may have a family member who is not Muslim and the shaitan says to you, hey, just out of goodness to them, why don't you go and share some of their religious acts? Only out of goodness. You don't really believe in it. Just go and do it for their sake. The shaitan will always work around you in any way for you to compromise your faith and justify some way of making partners with Allah. That is, that's his first trick. So this is the first way and this is the ultimate way. The second one he does, if he can't win you over with shirk, with polytheism, he will try to win you over by convincing you to do major sins. Major sins. Such as alcohol and zina, murder, uh, sorcery, it's in the Quran. Uh, for example, um, stealing and theft and so on. Major sins. We had a talk about major sins and minor sins a few months ago. It's on YouTube. You can go and look at it on our YouTube page. Major sins. Why major sins? Because major sins at least can get you a punishment. And if you can convince you to do one major sin, it'll get you to do the next major sin. Because once you do the first one, you become desensitized, the next one's going to be easier. The shaitan's working step by step. Remember that. If he starts off with major sins, it's working towards shirk. If he starts off with minor sins, working towards major sins. It will never stop. So he'll start to try to justify major sins to you. And he'll come up to you and say, Hey man, look, God tells you in the Quran that he forgives. He's ghafoor rahim He reminds you of the verses. The shaitan can even go to whispering to you to open the Quran and he says to you, Oh look, beautiful verse. What a miracle. Allah wanted to show you that verse to tell you he is forgiving. But, so go and do major sin. Afterwards, ask Allah to forgive you, man. Go to Umrah and do a couple of Umrahs. You'll be all right. Pray a few prayers. Your major sin is gone. He'll try to trick you that way. Listen to this. Some people, this is how the shaitan works with them. You ready? You come to a person who lies. You try to advise your brother or someone. Don't lie, man. Say, hey. Shaitan comes and gives you arrogance and says, yeah, I lie. At least I admit it. Others people don't even admit it. So I'm good. I tell the truth. But you're still lying. The shaitan says, good on you, man. At least you do it. You don't hide it. He makes you look like if you say that you lie, if you continue to lie, and as if you do it in open, like as if you're not a hypocrite anymore. At least you're not a hypocrite. These are lies. He's lying to you. <laughs> From the lies, you can't go, hey, at least I'm not like other people who steal. You get a person who steals, says, yeah, I steal. But at least I admit it. And I'm just not like other people who deal in drugs. You go to the person who deals in drugs says, Yeah, I deal in drugs, but at least I don't deal in heavy drugs, like other people. You go to the other guy who deals in heavy drugs says, Yeah, I deal in heavy drugs, at least I don't sell it to children like others. Come to the guy who sells it to children and say, Yeah, at least I sell it to children, but at least I tell their parents about it and I only sell them the light stuff. Come to another person says, Yeah, I sell yeah, I only sell it, mate. Because they want it, but I don't take it. I don't take it, I'll just sell it. 
It's up to them. So now you've got a human shaitan. That's exactly what shaitan does. You can't the other guy who takes it and sells it says, yeah, well, at least I don't go murdering people. Come to the murderer and says, yeah, I murder people. At least I don't murder children like others. They'll, you know where I'm going with this, right? You say, hey, at least, at least, you know, I did my time and at least I'm going to prison for it. Yeah, yeah, I'll keep doing it. Everybody looks at someone else who's worse than them. I mean, you can keep going on and on, guys. But then you have other people who beat the shaitan and they say, subhanAllah, I know I'm praying my five daily prayers, alhamdulillah, and I don't do drugs and I don't do any of the major sins. But oh, wallah, I, you know, there are others, mashaAllah, who pray their sunnahs. I, I wish I can do the sunnah. I, I need to do the sunnah. You go to the guy who does all the sunnahs, the sunnahs goes, well, alhamdulillah, I'm doing the sunnah. But you know, there are other people, mashaAllah, they donate so much. I wish I can do that. And you go to the guy who donates and says, yeah, alhamdulillah, I donate. But man, there are others, mashaAllah, the amount of help that they give to other people and how they are to their mum and dad and their honesty. That's what we should be. Allah tells us, This is what people who compete should be competing in. Not the other way. Not looking at who's worse than you. Look at who's better than you in good deeds. The only time you look at someone who's worse off than you is when it comes to blessings. Like money, finance, health, family, all of that stuff. Look at those who are less fortunate than you because that will help you remember your own blessings and you become a little bit better and your mental state will be better and you'll be happier than to look at someone who's got more than you because then you'll never live happily. You'll always be um, in stress and you'll always be competing. Number three, if the shaitan cannot get you in major sins, he gets you in minor sins. And comes up to you and says, Hey man, you're not doing any major sins. The Quran says if you pray, all your minor sins go away. Allah ghafoorur rahim. Just keep doing that. Just keep saying astaghfirullah azim. Yeah, it's true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does forgive you. But the shaitan knows that. He's not working on that. You see, the shaitan is trying to desensitize you to minor sins so that you no longer feel any um, guilt whatsoever. And then, when that's ready, it gets you to the major sins. So it's a footstep. If he can't get you with minor sins, the next step is, check this out. He busies you in, he busies you, makes you busy so that you take up your time in things that are permissible. Allah says this is halal, right? Permissible things. He makes you busy with permissible things and your hobbies until you overspend your time with them and you miss out on doing good deeds that would benefit you better. Some people, like for example, there's nothing wrong with playing games. But some people, they get obsessed with their games, they spend their entire nights on them, they, uh, then they sleep in past Fajr, they, they spend all their time when they could have done some other good deeds and it becomes an addiction. Some people, they get into their hobbies or they go into their whatever recreational activities, but they go overboard with it so that their entire time becomes that. So the shaitan makes you so busy with that that you forget. Some people must they come to pray to the masjid, you pray your maghrib, and then you get busy talking, 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 you haven't done your sunnah maghrib prayer. The shaitan says, yeah, keep talking, man, talk about, you know, what's happening overseas and talk about how the ummah is falling and how all the people are bad and whatever, and alhamdulillah, we're on a good path. Aisha comes, you missed your sunnah prayer. The shaitan gets you busy with these things. So that's another thing. If that doesn't work, the shaitan gets you with the sixth, with the fifth one. He gets you busy with minor good deeds at the expense of major good deeds. So for example, the shaitan will tell you, hey, tahajjud, man. See all that TikTok stuff? Everybody's talking about tahajjud. Tahajjud, 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 which is beautiful. But what the shaitan wants to do is says, do tahajjud and stay up in the entire night. And close to your fajr, the shaitan comes to you and says, man, you're tired. You've done a lot of tahajjud, sleep. Sleep five minutes before Fajr and say, anyway, look, the times that are on the phone, that someone said that they're not real, they're not really the right time. So, you know, pray 20 minutes after that time, just, just in case. So you go in and because you're so tired, what happens? You miss the entire Fajr and the sun rises. The shaitan can use that. The shaitan can make you busy with minor deeds so that you don't do the major deeds. So always prioritize. If you're a person who's going to sleep in, no, don't do your tahajjud, do your fajr prayer. Why don't you do a little bit early? Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi never stayed up the whole night. Some people, you know what they say to me? They say, Subhanallah, after that lecture I heard about waking up for fajr, you know what I do, bro? What do you do? I, pray, I play games all night because the only way that I can stay up because I don't want to miss out my fajr. Are well, you going to do that for the next 67 years of your life? Find a solution for crying out loud. You just want to play games. That's what you want to do. Now, I just gave some minor examples, but I think you guys can, inshallah, think of other examples. Um, <clears throat> if he can't get you with that, he gets you with something called innovating in your religion. The shaitan will try to justify your own way of worshipping God. 
I've met a lot of these types of people. They come up and they say, yeah, I know this is the better way, and I know this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Yeah, I know that this is what the Qur'an says. But hey, I worship God the way that I feel close to Him, man. The way I want to worship Him. So they go and make up their own type of worship. There is no better worship and closest to Allah than the way Allah told us, and the way the Prophet ﷺ taught us, and the way the ulama and scholars have told us. Not your own way. You know, so that's the shaitan. He says to you, yeah, so that you don't have to do what Allah guided you with. Number seven, uh, if he can't get you with all that, uh, he gets you with religious extremism. So you're so religious, he can't get you in any of that stuff. So he comes up to you and goes, look at all those other religious people. Look at them doing haram. That one's doing haram. That one's doing haram. That one's doing haram. Look at this guy on social media. I bet you he's just doing it for views and likes. Yalla, cancel him out. Go and talk bad things about it. Make takfir on this person. Make, say this person is a mushrik. This person is an innovator. This person is a bidah. In the name of commanding good and preventing evil. But what he's doing is he's going really out there and busying his or her entire time watching other people and belittling other people and all of that stuff until they grow a hardened heart and start hating everyone around them, man. I've seen a lot of these types of people. Extremism in that. So the shaitan gets you become extreme and focused on accusing other religious people. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. فَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى Never praise yourselves in piety. It is Allah who knows who is truly more pious. So you've got to be very careful with these things, brothers and sisters. Number eight, if he can't get you with that, the final trick of the shaitan is he turns people against you to make you give up on your practice and work. He'll go and whisper to your cousins, to your friends, to people around you. He'll make you read comments on social media for a good post that you put up and, or a nice video that you shared that reminds people that will affect you. The shaitan will say, look what they're saying. Look at that person. Look at that person. He'll whisper to people around you to come and put you off your practice. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the big tricks of the shaitan. In order to use people against you so that you can give up and hate the day that you even became religious. This is what the shaitan wants a person to do. And a great imam by the imam Ahmad, <clears throat> when he was on his deathbed, he, uh, his son entered and he heard his father while he was unconscious doing this. He's unconscious and he's saying, Oh, not yet, not yet, not yet. And the son misunderstood what his father is saying. Imam Ahmad, he said to him, Oh, father, after he woke up, he says, I, I, I heard you saying something that doesn't sound good. You're saying not yet. You don't want to die yet. You don't want to meet Allah yet. That's not a good sign. Why? You don't want to meet Allah? Is it? And then he said, oh no, son. Oh no. When I went unconscious, the shaitan came to me in my dreams, my qareen. I'll talk about that. The shaitan came to me and he said to me, لَقَدْ فَلَتَّ مِنِّي يَا أَحْمَدْ Oh, Ahmad, you've escaped me. I tried all my life, but now you've escaped me. You're on your deathbed. And I knew the tricks of the shaitan. He wants me to let my guards down. So I said to him, not yet, not yet. The battle of the shaitan will try right up to the last point that you're breathing. Right up to the last point that you're breathing. So always be aware of his tricks, inshallah ta'ala. Now, I mentioned Qareen. A Qareen, brothers and sisters, is a shaitan with whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates with every human being that is born. This is mentioned in the Quran. That Qareen whispers to you and does all those little tricks. That Qareen never leaves you alone. And it's in Surah Qaf, for example. Allah says, وَقَالَ قَرِينُهُ رَبَّنَا مَا أَطْغَيْتُهُ وَلَكِنْ وَلَكِنْ كَانَ فِي ضَلَالٍ بَعِيدٍ قَالَ لَا تَخْتَصِمُوا لَدَيَّ وَقَدْ قَدَّمْتُ إِلَيْكُمْ بِالْوَعِيدِ ما يبدل القول لدي وما أنا بظلام للعبيد. Allah says in Surah Qaf, and on the day of judgment, his his or her own Qareen, that Shaitan that was stuck to them all their life, will 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 call out and say, Oh my Lord, Oh my Lord. I did not lead him or her astray, but they were just so too far that they listened to me. And so Allah will say, don't sit arguing and debating in front of me today. Each one of you will get what they deserve. My, my promise and my warnings are said once and they never change. And today they will not change. I will be fair and just. So brothers and sisters, that is the Qareen. Finally, the shaitan some people might say, look at this grown man who is talking about some supernatural being that we can't see seriously. Well, 
I refer to the Quran. And the Quran is the thing or the, the book which told us about him. The Bible said it before, the original Bible, the Torah says it before, the scriptures that came all before. Shaitan, Satan, Iblis. Uh, the, when you go to sleep, some people they have this thing called a uh, sleep paralysis. Have you ever had that before? You feel like something's come and a weight is on you and you can't move and you can't talk. So there's different names it's called a kabus or a qabus. So you feel these things and sometimes you see nightmares and you feel like it's real and there's creatures and things like that. So these are actually the shaitan, the jinns. Do they harm you? No. Don't worry about it. It does not harm you. They just like to scare you. And the shaitan always likes to put fear because with fear, there is vulnerability. So don't be afraid. And if you do have that and you wake up, just go like this. Act like you're spitting towards that direction three times and say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. I seek refuge in Allah from the Shaitan, the outcast. Three times, turn to the other side. And so if you're on the right, turn to the left, left, turn to the right. And just put your hands in like this and recite the three quls. Qul Allahu Ahad, Qul Abrab Bin Nas, Qul Abrab Bil Falaq, and Ayatul Kursi. Ayatul Kursi is in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, where Abu Huraira and another companion, Uqba, were guarding the social security, the center link of the Muslims, and the shaitan came in the form of uh, a man, and he tried to steal, and it's a long story, and uh, he said to him, let me go, and I'll teach you something. If you recite Ayat al-Kursi every time you go to sleep, no shaitan can harm you. So Rasul said, he has spoken the truth, although he is a liar, that was the shaitan. That was the shaitan. So recite Ayat al-Kursi, insha'Allah ta'ala, and shaitan has no power over you, my dear brothers and sisters. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that something's going wrong with you. No. Shaitan can get through even to believers. So, brothers and sisters, there is a lot to say about it. I hope, inshallah, in this short talk, <laughs> short talk, that uh, inshallah, you all benefited from it. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, keep us aware of ourselves and not let us be uh, among those who let the shaitan take the better of us. Remember, he is weak, it is weak. There's no power over you, and so do that. When you go into your house, say Bismillah. When you eat, say Bismillah. When you go to the toilet, say Al-Bilay min al-Khubti wal-Khabab. Do all these dhikr words, and the shaitan will weaken and weaken and weaken and move away from you. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the shaitan of the jinns and the ins, and from the shaitan of ourselves, when we can be shaitans. Ameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.